Welcome. This is the Cisco CCNA ENSA, also known as the Enterprise Networking Security and Automation course. This course focuses on the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is course 3 of 3. Module 13, Virtualization. So we're going to be looking at cloud, virtualization, SDNs, virtual network infrastructure, and we're going to end it with our controllers. So let's jump right on in about cloud technology. First of all, data centers, we have to understand what SSA, PSAs, and IAASs are. We also need to understand the difference between a type 1 and type 2 hypervisor. All right, so jumping in we have our overall cloud environment and the cloud will provide a way for us to identify and address certain management issues such as enabling access to organizational data anywhere anytime it also allows for streamlining the organization's IT operations thus you can only subscribe to the services you need being able to save money Eliminate or reduce the need for on-site staff. Uh, I wouldn't say eliminate, but definitely reduce. Uh, sometimes, uh, if you're doing infrastructure as a service, maybe offloading your routing capability off of a extremely expensive router onto a cheaper one, sure. Uh, definitely being able to reduce management and uh, overall costs of technology. That, that's definitely... Def uh, a use for cloud-based services. Also reducing the cost of equipment, physical equipment, uh, requirements as well as personnel and training needs. However, cloud-based services, you may have to increase certain training budgets so that users are familiar with how to do certain things. One of the nice things with cloud is it allows for and it enables rapid response to increase volume requirements or resource requirements, it becomes very elastic, meaning if you need to increase uh, your storage uh, capacity, you can do that. If you need to increase your compute capacity, you can balloon up the resources that you need, and when you're done with them, you can scale them back. Thus, only using or only subscribing to the services and the hardware that you need when you need them. Some of the core cloud services are things such as, come on, change the slide. Sometimes PowerPoint's annoying. There are three main services, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. Software as a service is things like applications that you can run in the cloud, such as like Office 365. You can run Word, PowerPoint, Excel from a web browser. That's software as a service. Our platform as a service is responsible for providing users access to development tools and services used to deliver those applications. Where infrastructure as a service gives uh, IT managers access to networking equipment, virtualized network services, and other supporting network infrastructure. So if you are getting a Ubuntu machine. That could also be falling on the platform as a service. If you're getting a virtual switch connection, that would be infrastructure as a service. And those are the big three. There are way more services out there. There's IT services as a service. There's ransomware as a service. There's disaster recovery as a service. There is a lot of as a service, but those are the big three that are expected to be tested on. When we're talking cloud models, this is going to be how the clouds are going to function. There are four main types, public, private, hybrid, and community. Community is a, a cloud that's created for exclusive use by a specific community only. The difference between a public and a community cloud are that the functional needs that have the customized for the community. For example, healthcare must be compliant with policies and laws, HIPAA, for example, that require specialized authentication and confidentiality above what a private cloud or public cloud may be uh, handle. 
A public cloud are cloud-based applications and services made available to the general population. Private clouds are applications and services extended for a specific organization that are normally paid for. A hybrid is essentially a public and private kind of rolled into one, and it's made up of two or more clouds, again, either part private or partially public or combination, where each part remains a separate object, but are both connected using a single type of architecture. Those are the four main types of our cloud models. So a common question then becomes, what's the difference between a cloud and a data center? Well, normally, a data center will have data storage, processing facilities ran by in-house IT. A data center are typically expensive and they build and maintain those resources. A cloud computing device is typically an off-premises service that offers on-demand access, a shared resource of configurable computing resources. Realistically, both of these are on a cloud. A data center provides servers, provides uh, backup, provides internet, but the compute requirements are not there. So you can have cloud providers like Azure or AWS or Google's um, cloud services. They have the additional resources that they can grow or scale uh, to the individuals that subscribe to those services. If you do your own cloud, you're limited by the resources that you have. You can't balloon above the resources that you have where with traditional cloud computing, the main providers, again, Azure, AWS, or Google's um, cloud services, they have additional resources that they can essentially lease you. Data centers are physical facilities. Cloud computing, realistically, are also located in a data center. It's just you're not the one managing them. Someone else is. So moving on, we have our virtualization. The term cloud computing and virtualization often are used interchangeably. But they're not the same at all. Virtualization is the foundation of cloud computing, but that doesn't mean that they are identical. Virtualization separates the operating system from the hardware and thus allows various providers to offer like virtual services. Essentially, it's software running on top of other software. That's the purpose of virtualization. So here we can have four, eight, a dozen servers. And before, they used to be individual servers, physical machines. However, with server virtualization, we can have one physical server or two physical servers running a hypervisor. Hypervisor is the software or the firmware that allows us to put virtualized servers on top of them. So here we have two servers running a hypervisor and inside that hypervisor they're virtualizing four machines each. So here we have two physical servers acting like eight servers. Now there are different levels of virtualization also. Also you can nest virtualization. So you can have a hypervisor that allows you to install another hypervisor that allows you to nest another hypervisor and each one of them could be virtualizing machines. However, all of them have a very finite amount of resources. The physical resources you don't get to escape from. If you only have 8 gigs of RAM, you only have 8 gigs of RAM. It's just, it is what it is. Advantages of virtualization, normally less equipment, less energy, less space. However, the server that you do purchase need to have enough resources to run all of the virtualized servers. That means you have to also include for faster servers. You're also going to have to account for server uptime as well as disaster recoverability. We have a, a abstract layer that allows us to understand how the software is supposed to function. 
So at each of these layers of abstraction, some type of programming code is used to interface between the layer above and below it. So in order to gain access to the hardware, we have to have some t uh, something. In order to gain access to the software, the OS, the services, there are different layers that allow for this. For our virtualization, our hypervisor will actually act as an intermediary between the op our operating systems. These are going to be guest operating systems and the hypervisor. When you they need to access a resource like a RAM or a processor, the hypervisor is what's going to interact with the firmware and then the firmware will interact with the hardware. With physical servers, the operating system deals directly with the firmware, but because again the hypervisor is virtualizing multiple servers, there has to be some way to manage the multiple guest OS's and their access to the firmware. We have a type 2 hypervisor and this is software that creates and runs VMs uh, instances. This is a computer on a hypervisor that will support additional computers. So when it's hardware and a hypervisor directly on the hardware, that's a type one. If we are dealing with a hardware, then an operating system, and then hypervisor, that's a type two. So for example, you install VMware Workstation on top of Windows 10. That's a type two, because that means, I want my pen. Your base operating system is Windows 10. You install our VMware Workstation, and inside VMware Workstation, you can have your different OSs. That's why it's Type 2. The big advantage of Type 2 hypervisors is that management console software is not really required. You can load the primary operating system. Here, that would be called the host operating system. You install the hypervisor, example, VMware Workstation, and inside there, you can install all of your guest OSs, and you can turn them on and turn them off based off of your leisure. Nice thing is, we also have what's called virtual network infrastructure. So we just talked about type two, and we've been talking about type one for a little while, but type one goes a little bit more in depth. Again, hardware, that's gonna be the physical hardware, and then directly on top of that will be our hypervisor. That'll be type one. That might be VMware ESXi, for example. The type one hypervisor will be directly installed on the hardware. This is also called bare metal. So when we are installing a VM on a hypervisor, we have to have some type of management software to be able to install that. Cisco has a Cisco Unified Computing System Manager. Windows has Hyper-V. Um, Hyper VMware has ESXi and a web GUI. And again, there's a plethora of other versions out there. It's just these are some of the common ones. So what happens when we bring in the complexity of network virtualization? If we were just talking about all of our virtual machines and uh, being able to separate all of the VMs, how can we guarantee traffic is actually being kept separate? So server virtualization hides server resources. This can create problems when we are designing the network. VMs are movable, and these are objects that can be added, dropped, and changed pretty quickly. So with that in mind, we have to also look at what resources on the network are going to be available. So traffic flow may differ from the traditional client server model. So with that, we have to have a considerable amount of traffic will be exchanged between the virtual servers that can change in location and intensity over time and over a given uh, short period of time. For example, you may have one server in one location that's pretty idle, but you know, Monday for four hours, that server may generate a ton of traffic. So that server now is going to consume a ton of bandwidth that normally it wouldn't. Those are some of the things that we have to uh, deal with. 
So part of that will also mean the dynamic will ever be changing and the traffic requirements have to be flexible enough to meet all of these needs. That's why we have things like QoS. However, in the larger enterprises using multi-vendor equipment, each time a new VM is enabled, they may have to be reconfigured and that can also be very time consuming. The network infrastructure can be a benefit from virtualization, just like the actual server infrastructure can benefit. So network functions can be virtualized just like anything else. Each network device can be segmented into multiple virtual devices that operate independently of one another. We have what's called virtual routing and forwarding planes. They are called VRFs. We have our VLANs. However, with virtualization, VLANs slowly are becoming obsolete because realistically they can't keep up. In one of my other videos, I discussed VXLANs, and that's a improvement on VLANs, but that is definitely a CCMP level topic. Moving on, we have our software defined networks, our SDNs. So we're going to be looking at network programming, looking at SDNs, and we're going to wrap it up with our controllers. So first of all, our controllers will have two main types of planes. That's going to be a control plane and a data plane. The control plane is typically regarded as the brains of a device. They do all of the layer 2 and layer 3 functioning, the routing, the forwarding, the address tables, STP, ARP tables, all of this is sent to the control plane and is processed by the processor. The data plane is also called the forwarding plane, and this is the plane that will typically deal with the switch fabric, connecting the various network ports to a device, and the network plane for each device will be used to forward traffic accordingly. Routers and switches will use information from the control plane to forward incoming and outgoing traffic appropriately. Information in the data plane is typically processed by a specific data plane processor without having to get the controller plane's CPU involved. So one area that's important to understand is that the control plane and the data plane will have additional features. The data plane may also look at the CEF. This is an advanced layer 3 IP switching technology that allows for the forwarding of packets to occur, again, at the data plane. And this is all without involving the control plane or the control plane's CPU. So basically what ends up happening is the SDN is basically the separation of the control plane and the data plane. The control plane function is removed from each device and is performed by a centralized controller. The centralized controller will communicate and it will perform the appropriate function. Each device can now focus on just forwarding data while the centralized controller will manage the data flow. So when we're talking a large level switch, you'll have controllers in there. Typically those controllers are the control plane. They are not the data plane. The individual stacks in there should have their own data plane. We also have what's called a management plane. And this is responsible for managing the device through a connection to the network. Normally, the administrator will have the connection like SSH or uh, HTTPS or maybe even SNMP. They can use things like FTP or TFTP for copying content to and from. Within our architecture, we have two main support areas for development, developing network virtualization. That is our software-defined networking, SDN networks, and our Cisco application-centric infrastructure, ACIs. The SDN is a network architecture that virtualizes the entire network, offering a new approach to network admin and management. The Cisco's ACI is a purpose-built hardware solution for integrating cloud computing and data center management. So the SDN can also include things like OpenFlow, OpenStack, and other components like Trill or FabricPath or some form of 802.1aq. OpenFlow is a Stanford University 
a development approach for managing traffic between networking devices. OpenStack is basically a approach to virtualization and orchestration platforms designed to build scalable cloud environments. A traditional and SDN architecture. A traditional architecture will have each device having their own control and their own data plane. Within the SDN architecture, we will have a control plane and each device will have their own separate data plane. And the nice thing with this is you can have one control plane that will manage multiple devices. The SDN controller is a logical entity that will allow administrators to manage and dictate how the data plane of switches will handle traffic. The complete SDN framework is shown in the figure next to uh, the text. The SDN controller will use both northbound APIs to communicate the upstream application and to allow for the southbound APIs to define the behavior. Essentially here, as long as data is flowing, it's going to handle on the data plane. Anything that we're going to have to uh, work with routing or layer 3 content, it may have to go to the control plane. Or other type of traffic engineering, again, that will have to go to the control plane. The nice thing is you can have multiple devices operating at the data plane and they can all share one SDN based controller. So most of what we've been discussing is all about controllers. However, we're not quite done. There is still a lot left in controllers to go over. So within our SD or within our controllers, the big one is going to be our SDN controllers. And we have to talk about their operations. So the SDN controller will define the data flow between the centralized control plane as well as all of the paired or matching data planes. So we can have multiple end devices, multiple switches, that all are sharing one controller plane. Each flow will travel through the network and must first get permission from the controller, which will verify the communication. The complexity as well as the more complex functions are going to be performed by the controller. Again, here the data plane is handling the bulk of the basic traffic. Anything complex has to come to the controller. And again, the controller has to give permission. So there are three main tables that we need to be aware of. The flow table, the group table, and the meter table. The flow table will match incoming packets to a particular flow and will specify the functions that are to be performed on those packets. A group table, again, this is going to be a flow table, may direct a flow to a group table, and this will trigger a variety of actions affecting one or more data flows. A meter table is basically a table that will trigger a variety of performance-related actions based on a flow, and that will include the ability to rate limit the traffic. So the QoS functionality is going to be part of the meter table if you didn't know by the name meter. If we're talking specialized video, so some of the SDN tools will provide the features for automation of the network. This helps to accelerate application development and align infrastructure to requirements. So Cisco has to develop the ACI to meet these objectives. So within the ACI, it's a hardware solution for integrating cloud-based computing and data center management at a higher level. So the policy elements of the network which should be removed from the data plane, this will simplify the way the data center uh, networks are being designed and functioning. So the core components of our ACI are things like the Application Network Profile, ANP. This is a collection of endpoint groups. We have our application policy infrastructure controllers, APICs. We also have a Cisco Nexus 9000 series switch, and these are switches that will provide application aware switching fabrics that will work with the appropriate APICs. So the APICs will position between the APNs and the ACI enabled network infrastructure to allow for the translation. This is gonna be more application aware switching. Not quite switch labeling, 
but the switches are going to understand applications. So how do these function? They, they function by having essentially a software, piece of software that will interconnect the network profile. So we can have things like the VLAN or VMware or other web services separate from the actual underlying hardware. So the Cisco will have an ACI fabric and this will be composed of the APICs and you can normally find these like in the uh, Cisco Nexus 9000 series switch. And they will use what's called the two-tier spine leaf topology, as we see in this diagram. So you're going to have these different leaves that connect to the actual core spine. And the leaves will actually connect to the APICs. When compared to an SDN, the APIC controller does not manipulate the data path directly. Instead, the APIs will centralize the policies, the definitions, and the programs. The leave switches to forward the traffic based off of these defined policies. So here they're using policies to shape the flow of traffic. Where with SDNs, we have like a device-based SDN, and we're gonna have some type of centralized application where the data plane will still be on each device. So the devices are programmed by applications running on the device itself or on a server. With a controller-based SDN, we have the controller being the actual hardware function and we have an application sitting on top of it. It will still use a centralized controller that has knowledge of all of the devices in the network as shown below. The application can interface with the controller and it can be responsible for managing the device as well as manipulating traffic. For example, here we can be using the OpenSDN controller as a commercial distribution of the Open Daylight controller. We also have a policy-based SDN and this is very similar to controller-based SDNs where we have a centralized controller that has views of all the devices. But here we have the policy-based SDN will include the policy layer that will orchestrate or operate at higher levels of the abstraction layer. It will use built-in applications that will automate the advanced configuration that will guide uh, the individual through the workflow of the GUI. Here we're looking at the Cisco API CEM is an example of this type of SDN controller. If we're looking at the API CEN features, this is going to be the topology flow of the software so that you can understand how to manage those devices and how this will actually allow for the workflow to be created. This tool will allow us to discover and access devices, inventory of hosts and other assets, we can view the topology and we can look at the policies and paths to our endpoints. We can also look at how administration can be done through visualization based tools. And that is actually all for this chapter. We do have a lab installing Linux as a VM to explore the GUI. We have follow ups for our as a service software infrastructure platform. We looked at the four types of cloud. We looked at virtualization versus cloud. We looked at type one versus type two hypervisors. We looked at a drill down of type one hypervisors and we started getting into our SDNs and our ACIs and how they function. We looked at how SDN uh, controllers worked and we looked at common core functions of an ACI. And again, that was the APNs, APICs, and the appropriate hardware series switches. And then lastly, we looked at types of SDNs, devices, controllers, or policy-based, and how the APIC EN use uh, to define the policy-based function of our SDN. And that is it for this chapter. If you have any questions, concerns, please reach out. Thank you. If you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out. Again, with this material, being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture 
help build long-term retention, so do not be afraid to, to communicate with this topic. Again, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you.